Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Galatians. We'll be starting a series on Galatians 1 and 2. Don't tell anybody, but we'll probably be going all the way through Galatians, but because we have short attention spans, it's just a series in Galatians 1 and 2, um, which would probably be followed by a series in Galatians 3 and 4, which probably be followed by a series in Galatians 5 and 6. Don't tell anybody that. Just think 1 and 2, okay? And uh, anyway, it's a rich book. I've never preached through Galatians in, in all my years of preaching just selected texts, and so I'm excited about what the Lord is going to say to me and to you. Today we'll be in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. A couple of years ago, I decided that I was going to, for the first time, make a New Mexico pozole. And I, I don't cook much, uh, but every now and then I'll get, you know, just excited about some project. And, uh, and so I decided, this, I'm going to do this. So it sounded good, and I, and I knew it was healthy, so I, you know, tried, found a recipe and went and got the, the, the stuff and, and all this. And so because I was partially trying to add something healthy to my life and to our lives, and I was cooking a big pot for the whole family, I thought, well, let's make it a little healthier. Why not throw some zucchini in? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what my kids said. Uh, they were beside themselves. What, Dad, what are you thinking? I was like, it's just a, you know, it's just stew. It's just, you know, red stew, tastes good. Throw some more vegetables in there. I didn't know that they were pozole purists uh, already in there. T- Which reminds me of one of the other times they let me cook. On, uh, we were camping, and, uh, and we had some, you know, some things there. And I was, you know, grilled zucchini, right? Well, cucumber's green. They did not like grilled cucumber. I just couldn't believe it. Like I said, I don't do a lot of cooking. <laughs> but, but yeah, I found out, and, and, and even your reaction was wonderful because you don't mess with pasole by putting zucchini in it. I'll never do that again unless I'm making it just for me. Well, there are things in life uh, that cause that reaction in us. You, you don't mess with certain recipes or certain ways of doing things. On a much bigger scale, Paul is beside himself. He is going bananas because of something that is being skewed and altered in the region of Galatia. Paul had been there on his first missionary journey. There were those who came to Christ. Paul trained them, and churches were planted. Paul left, and the Judaizers have now hit the streets of Galatia. Think Turkey, basically. So the, the Judaizers have hit, and the message of the Judaizers is, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but you need Jesus and the law, and which involves circumcision and, and, and keeping all of the Old Testament festivals and rules. And these are Gentile believers here in this region of Galatia. They were saying that And they were saying, this Paul who's been here, you don't need to listen to him because he wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't one of the 12. The apostle, the word means sent one, but uh, those apostles were those who saw Jesus face to face. And so Paul is not as upset about the apostle part as he is the gospel part. Now, Paul's going to address a few times in this letter the apostle part. Why? Why? because he wants them to listen to the gospel, not because he cares about his own uh, status there. So let's read these first 10 verses, and we'll dig into uh, this intro to the book of Galatians. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our, fa- and our God and Father, to whom be glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. 
which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So Paul, quickly, when he hears about what's happening with the Judaizers there, he takes his pen and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit writes through the hands of Paul to these believers in the region of Galatia. Paul, he says, an apostle. So Paul here, right in the very intro, he's going to address a couple of things. He's going to lay down a couple of themes for this book here in the intro. And the first is having to do with him being an apostle. We know that Paul did see Jesus there on the road to Damascus when God saved him, when God came down and said, that's enough. Now, this zealot persecuting my church, I've called him to take all of those skills and passions and to be used by me to get the gospel to the lost. In fact, when the Spirit went to Ananias in Acts chapter 9 to tell him that he needed to go talk to this Saul, who would become Paul, who was persecuting the church, God said to Ananias, I'm gonna, he's going to suffer for me, but I'm going to send him far and wide. He was a sent one, an apostle. So Paul addresses that here at the beginning. And he says, essentially through this letter, you're going to hear Paul say, people come and go. Again, we're going to see over and over, it's not about Paul. He's not trying to lift himself up for himself, but he wants them to listen to him. And because they only want to listen and they've been told to only listen to apostles, he's saying, I wasn't sent by a group of men. I was sent by God. And so he says, it's not about people. People come and go. But we've got to, whether you're in first century reading this letter in Galatia or whether you're in 2022 here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, wherever you may be watching, you've got to have a firm foundation and there must be a sole authority. And the only possible sole authority for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word of God. If it's not the authority, then we'll never get anywhere. We, we just might as well uh, go have church by ourselves and go with what we think is best. It has to be the sole authority. Uh, to their shame, the Judaizers and the Gentile believers here in Galatia, they didn't have all the Scripture we have, but they did have uh, a, a growing scripture. They had the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. They should have known better. But he says, I am an apostle. But then he hits here also, right in the beginning, he hits theme number two, and that is uh, the overarching reason that he wrote, and that is the, the purity of what is the gospel. So he says in verse one again towards the end, uh, I've been sent by Jesus Christ, God the Father, and I'm writing to you also by the brethren who are with me. Uh, we know in the Old Testament, uh, in, in their life, uh, the Jewish life, it took two or three witnesses to establish something, so he gives three witnesses here. And he says, I'm writing to you, churches of Galatia, and he says, grace to you and peace. Now, every word in the Scripture is there on purpose with the purpose. There, there are no just extra words. There's no filler in the Scripture. Paul often says this very phrase, or sometimes he'll add another, but there's significance to it. Uh, grace to you because it is by grace that we come to know Christ as our Savior, which then brings peace. And so there's an order even to it from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here in verse 4, he hits right off the bat this second theme. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus Christ, he says, that's all, he's already getting at it. He, he hasn't gotten into the, he's in the fourth verse, and he's already, he, he's getting into what he's writing about. Folks, the Judaizers are telling you, you need Jesus plus something else. But he says, I'm writing to you to say, it was Jesus who willingly gave himself. No one took his life. He gave it on the cross. He was God from before time began. And because of my sin, because of your sin, he decided before the creation of the world and before time began that he would give himself on the cross 
And so he did so. He says, he willingly gave himself for our sins. Only one possible payment for your sin. There's nothing else you can do. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing else that will suffice. Jesus came to give himself to pay for my sin, that he might rescue us from this present evil age. We live, we still walk on this earth, with which God is uh, the controller and the sovereign a controller of all the earth and all the universe, but he has allowed temporarily for the devil to have influence in this world. So he says, he's going to rescue us. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, when you stop living on this earth, he will rescue you to be with him in heaven forever. But even while we walk the streets of this earth spiritually, he rescues us so that we become true citizens of heaven, even though we have an earthly citizenship here on this earth. So he's already hitting in at this. He did this according to the will of God and, and of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. If you've got to do something else, plus Jesus, somebody else needs to get some of the glory. But if Jesus is all you need, then this is true. To him be the glory forever and ever and ever. And how insulting, we don't, people don't, you don't think of it this way, but how insulting it is to Jesus to think that he would leave the glories of heaven as God, come to be born, to live as 100% God, 100% man, die willingly on a cruel cross he didn't deserve just because of my sin, just because of your sin, and then to think that we need to add something to it is truly an insult to him, even though that's not the, the intent of the heart when we're tempted to think that way. <clears throat> so he gets into these two themes, but then he's going to go into, we're going to look in verses 6 and 10 at two grave disappointments that Paul has. First, he's gravely disappointed with the Galatian Christians. Every one of Paul's letters, he always starts with some con- commendation, some commendation, some encouragement to the, to the recipients of the letter. Hey, you're doing a good job about this. Are you doing a good job? Even to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth had so many issues, so many problems. Even to the church at Corinth, he said, you know, you're doing some good here and there. But to the Galatians, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because this issue was so important, he just dives right in. He says, let's just skip all the pleasantries. Let's get into what I'm very frustrated about and, and truly frustrated in a good way. I am amazed, uh, one has said, I am blown away, would be the equivalent here. I'm amazed, I can't believe it, that you so quickly are deserting him. And the so quickly there likely means it didn't take these Judaizers long at all to begin to persuade you to think differently. Now, we know that if you truly come to know Christ as your Savior, you're born again, you can't be unborn again. So once you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a believer. He's not even saying you've lost your salvation. He said, but you're being swayed. You're, you're messing up everything in your whole thinking and the, and, and the message of the gospel by listening to these Judaizers. It's, it's, it happens so quickly. I'm so amazed that you would desert him who called you, once again, by the grace of Christ. For that's all you need. What is the gospel? The gospel is not very complicated, Paul would say to us, and and we would say to one another. The gospel uh, essentially says that God created us, and Adam and Eve, we've, we've looked at before, Adam and Eve allowed the devil to tempt them. Sin came into the world. Everyone born after that has been born inheriting a sin nature, and as soon as our little grubby hands can, and as soon as our little bitty baby minds can, We put feet and thought and words to that sin nature, and we sin against God. And that then somebody has to pay for that sin. Well, the problem is only someone sinless can pay for our sin. And so the Lord Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven, came to the earth, lived without sin, died in my place, died in your place, so that if we put our faith in what Jesus Christ did to pay for our sin, we will be born again, and we will belong to him forever and ever. It's, it's like getting married. What do, what do you do to get married uh, besides all the preparation uh, for the ceremony itself? What do you do? You walk down the aisle, you stand there, and you say, I do, and you're married, and that's it. Now, there, there's a balance in everything. Of course, if you get married, some things need to change in your life. 
because you're no longer single. You come to Christ, things are going to change. But those things that change aren't the things that make you a believer. It's the result of becoming a believer. And so what happens is that we look at results of coming to Christ. We pick our favorite ones and the ones that are easier for us sometimes. And we say that's part of becoming a believer. That's not part of becoming a believer. That's the fruit of becoming a believer. And again, we usually leave out the ones that we don't like, and so we harp on, if you really are a believer, this means, this is what it means to become a believer. Well, that's what's happening with the Judaizers. They say, yeah, you you Gentile believers need to go back and keep the whole law. Starting in first century Rome, when the gospel is spreading around and continuing into 2022, folks, let me just remind you, we're not under the law. And so don't put yourself back under it. Now, learn, yes, learn from the Old Testament customs. Learn how much deeper you can understand what Christ did to set us free from the law. But don't put yourself back under it and start telling folks, look, you need to keep the festivals. You need to keep the Old Testament ways. No, learn from them, yes. But folks, Paul would say by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why would you want to go back? Never go back. We're not under the law. That's why Christ died. One of the many reasons was to set us free. So he says, I'm amazed. He called you by grace, and he says, you're deserting him for, and this is uh, significant here in verses 6 and 7, he says, you're deserting for a different gospel, which is really not another. The first different is hetero. It's different, but of a totally different kind. He says, uh, they're coming to you and saying, well, you know, this is the gospel. Yeah, yeah. But he says, no, that's not a different iteration of it. It's not a different way to say it. It's not the same gospel that they're telling you about. It's totally a different animal altogether. Therefore, it's not another. The, the other here is different, uh, but of the same kind. He says, it's not different of the same kind. It's different of a different kind. It's not the same thing. And so, He says, I am disturbed by the the distortion of the gospel. It's not really another, only there are some who are disturbing, troubling, agitating you, and wanting to make crooked, distort the gospel. Why is that so important to Paul? What's the big deal? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, and because what you start with at the core affects everything that happens after that. And you begin to start telling people, you are a Christian by believing this, but also doing this. This is what makes you a Christian. It goes right back to what we looked at earlier. You start taking the glory away from what Christ did. And you start messing with the recipe of the gospel. You weaken the gospel. And it begins to lose power. And it very quickly becomes religion. That that's how we know that we're right with God because we're good, or we're at least pretty good, and we're a lot better than those folks out there that we hear about on the news, and we begin to trust in ourselves, and then pretty soon the gospel that here actually transformed these Galatians' lives. They were born again, but they begin to spread this distorted gospel. Then the next generation, or at least a generation who will come quickly, would really not even be born again and will be trusting only in themselves and not in Christ. And so he says, it is crucial. And today the word gospel is just thrown around, attached to everything under the sun. Gospel this, gospel that. We used to have the social gospel. Now we've got the woke gospel, and we've got all of these things that are good things, but they aren't the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. And that I need to place my faith in him. Now, there are a lot of things that as I then begin to study the scripture and I begin to grow in Christ that I'm going to do. But those things aren't the gospel. Even in our Southern Baptist Convention, uh, for at least two years, our annual convention theme was the gospel above all. But I'm just going to tell you that when I went to those conventions, it really didn't seem to be about the gospel above all. It seemed to be about uh, this group and that group and this issue and, and all this, but it just attaching the word gospel to it, is, it weakens and takes away from the gospel. The gospel is the gospel, and that is the gospel. 
You see, the gospel says, do what Jesus says. Do what God says in his word. But the distorted gospel quickly becomes, do what I say. I become the preacher. You become the teacher. We become the believers that begin to tell people, you know what the gospel is? It's believing, but it's doing these things. Usually, right things, but they're just not the gospel. So Paul says, I'm alarmed by this thing. Yes, believing in Christ is going to result in action and fruit in my life, but that action and fruit is not the gospel. It's not what made me a believer. What Jesus did on the cross alone made me a believer. We were sharing the gospel when we first got to Japan with our language teacher, Kuyama Sensei. She taught missionaries for several decades. She'd heard the gospel. Every missionary who didn't speak Japanese yet was trying to share the gospel with Kuyama Sensei because she understood English. But she, she, was, she, she liked it, but she wasn't a believer. And she would tell us, I just need to clean my life up a little bit more, and then I can believe in Jesus. I just need to get a few more things straight, and then I can believe in Jesus. We taught, I don't know if it was Kathy or me, one of us or both of us, kept trying to tell her, that's the whole reason Jesus came, because you can't get your life together. You can't clean yourself up. You're going to clean up and clean up and clean up, and it'll still be insufficient. That's the whole reason Jesus had to come. You can't do anything to earn salvation. That's why he came. She went to a Valentine's event that was, she was invited by another missionary, a colleague of ours, and she finally heard, and she finally understood, to come to Jesus just as you are. Because you don't bring anything to the table except for your fallen, sinful nature. That is why he came. So Paul's frustrated that they have so quickly deserted what he taught them, but he's also very, very frustrated at the Judaizers. He says in verse 8, and he's using the reduction to absurdity. It's hyperbole. He's saying, but even if we or even an angel from heaven, he's not saying that the angels from heaven are likely to come and preach another gospel. He's just trying to say, I'm trying to think of the craziest scenario. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he is to be accursed. Strong word, anathema. It means set aside, dedicated by God for destruction. So Paul's not saying, you know, a a light little thing here. Hey, if those guys come again, just tell them Paul loves them, but please, you know, hold off. No, no, he's, he's, this is a strong word. I'm telling you, if someone else messes with the gospel, he says, they're to be dedicated to be destroyed. It's a strong word. It's not Paul. Paul's just the mailman. It's the Holy Spirit writing through him. And as we've said before, he says in verse 9, He repeats it. So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. He's pretty upset about it, I'd say. Are you a believer? Are you a Christian? How do you know? Well, pastor, I'm a Christian because, well, first off, my parents were, and and of course, I'm American, so that kind of means I'm a Christian already, right? No. Well, pastor, I'm a Christian uh, because I'm a member of this church and, uh, and because I teach Sunday school or I, I volunteer at the church and, and, uh, and, I, and I'm here pretty much every Sunday unless I'm sick, which is a good idea, by the way. Uh, church membership and church attendance, is, uh, it's, it's not to our good that it has changed. I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. Uh, but make it a, a weekly commitment in your life. Again, so that you're a Christian? No. Because I need to be here to be strengthened as a Christian. But see, all these things that we tend to answer, going to um, uh, other nations to share the gospel where there is a strong Catholic influence. It could happen here as well, of course. Tell me about your walk with Christ. And then the list comes. Well, I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And no, tell me, have you become a Christian? Have you placed your faith in Christ? Yeah, I do this. And I do. No, that, that's not how we know that we're a Christian. That's the fruit of being a Christian. And you say, Pastor, this seems a little simple. That you, why, why did you need to spend this long talking about it? Well, first off, because Paul did. But number two, because it really is core. Some of you, you, you don't 
think about it. You don't purposely say that, but if you're answering in your heart of hearts, you'd say, yeah, I do tend to think I'm a Christian because. I prove I'm a Christian because these things. Whereas Paul says, no, it's by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's what's hap- what happens. If you are a Christian because you're pretty good, what happens when you have a day that you're not pretty good? Uh, don't you be honest. You have those days. I do too. Am I not a Christian then? There's a book that I, I like. Uh, don't uh, necessarily even uh, recommend the author usually, uh, but there's a book, Stop Asking Jesus in Your Life, in Your Heart, I think it is. It's a good book because so many Christians fall into this cycle of, I think I, I may not be a Christian because I wasn't really following the Lord very faithfully today or this week or this month, so I need to ask Him again to become my Savior. And, and if you haven't been there, there are certainly Christians who can get into an endless cycle, vicious there. But again, where's the emphasis? It's, it's on me. Instead, as the author says so very well, when you placed your faith in Christ, whatever year that was in your life, what did that look like? It, it, did it look like I am a sinner who needs a Savior, and I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ to be my Savior? If it did... Have you stopped believing that? If not, chances are, and only you you and God would know for sure, you're still a believer. You just need to restore your fellowship. You need to repent of some things with the Lord. Now, again, uh, the the Scripture gives us balance as we look at the entire Scripture, the entirety of Scripture. If you can go 5, 10, 15, 20 years without thinking much about the Lord or your life and nothing really bothers you, there's a chance that you didn't get it right in the beginning. But if you look back and you say, no, I, the, the Lord entered my heart. I was born again. He changed me. And it wasn't just for a week. It wasn't just for a month. It wasn't just the seed that sprung up quickly and then, and then died away. No, I, I know that I came to know Christ as my Savior. Hang on to that because the devil's going to come lie to you and keep wanting you to get focused back on, I need to ask him again. I need to ask him again. I need to ask him again. And Paul says, folks, You don't become a Christian by being good. You become a Christian through the the simple, pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he will change you as the fruit of that action. But Paul wraps it up here in verse 10. They accused him, the Judaizers, of seeking the favor of others. And I'm sorry for the popping, Uh, folks. I have a new microphone, and it's it's not anybody's uh, fault here. We'll get this... uh, ironed out. But he says, uh, they, they said, he's, he's just trying to get their, their favor by saying you don't have to keep the law. And you're, you're just trying to win people uh, by making it easier on them. And Paul says here in verse 10, you know, as if they didn't know Paul by now, we know Paul. Uh, he's never one to mince words when necessary. Uh, parenthetically, this is not the message, but there are those who reject Paul's letters because they say he was harsh. He wasn't harsh. You ever read the beginning and the, and the end of, of the rest of his letters? Tell so-and-so high, tell so-and-so high. I long for you. I love you. Paul was not a harsh man. He was willing to tell the truth by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he says here, again, as if they haven't met Paul, he says, am I now seeking the favor of men? Did you read the first nine verses, he says, of my letter? Do you think I'm really trying to gain favor of men? No. He says, I'm telling you, the message is what's important. The message is more important than the messenger. And Paul says, I am disturbed about what is happening to the message of the gospel. It's still the same today. Uh, you know, when you're a Christian leader, you're going to have folks who are not happy with you. Uh, I gave up a long time ago thinking I could make the entire room 100% happy every uh, time. Here, here's the basis of my leadership. This will get you a, a senior coffee if you have a dollar uh, at, uh, <clears throat> at McDonald's. My leadership style is this. I try to make 40% of the people think that I should do this, 40% of the people think I should do this, and 20% of the people confused. And that, to me, that just kind of is a good uh, aim there. And uh, anyway, that was supposed to be humorous. But anyway, um, 
back on message, back on message. It's the same today, though. Yeah, Christian leaders, that's, that's part of the deal. But it, it's not about the, the, the leader. It's about the message and the unity and the harmony of the church. That's always what's important, and that's what Paul says as well. The gospel is the deal, and you're messing it up. There are those today, you're in this room, you're watching online, and, and you would say, you know what, I'm exactly there. I, I constantly struggle with, am I a believer because I'm not doing so well today in my walk with Christ? I can't answer that question, only you and God can. But let me say this, why don't you just nail it down today? Why don't you hear on January the 16th, 2022, write it in your Bible, and you, whether you're there in your pew, whether you come down here in a few minutes, whether you're online and you're at home, just nail it down. Because see, the devil wants to keep you running in circles. The devil wants to keep you in doubt all your life. He just loved that. But that's not what Jesus died on the cross for. Jesus died on the cross that you might know that you have eternal life. So I can't answer what's happened up to this point in your life. Only you and God know. But just nail it down today. God, from this moment on, January 16th, 2022 on, I just want to declare that I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I will sin against you until I enter heaven's gates. Yes, I know you want to grow me so that I'm being sanctified and, and coming to be more and more like Christ. But, but I just know. I, I have nothing to offer but I know that you, God, left heaven to die in my place on the cross. And I today, not sure what happened before, but I today, Lord, I just want to nail it down for sure and just say, I place my faith in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I want to grow in you, but Lord, I just ask you to help me to get off of this treadmill where I'm trying to be good and good and good to be a Christian. And I just want to say today, Lord, thank you that you died for me so that I can know forever and ever that I belong to you. And, and, and I just want to give you the, the, the freedom today to say that to God and get off that treadmill, whether you're here or whether you're online. Now, God's spoken to you. He's spoken to me in many ways. Maybe you know for sure that you're a believer and God in his providence has used this in a total different area in your life. And you need to just deal with God in that area. Some of you need to come to know Christ today. You say, there's no doubt, there's no confusion about the, the, the past for me. I know that I'm not a believer. But I'm just telling you it's that easy. Don't be like Kuyama Sensei and keep trying to clean your life up a little bit more. Just come as you are. That's the way he died for you and that's the way he wants you to come. Because he loves you that much. There's some today that you know Christ. You need to follow him in believer's baptism. So that you can be a Christian? No. So that you can go public and just do what he said to do and to mark yourself publicly as a believer and share the gospel in the picture of baptism. And then there are those of you that God said, you know what, this is your church home for this time in your life and you need to come and move your membership to this church for this chapter of your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word to me, Lord, in this text so, so simple, but yet so very important to you. And God, help us to be able to find the scriptural balance where we're not telling people they have to do certain things to be a Christian and then able to separate that balance to know that as believers we grow in you. Lord, I pray for that person today who's struggling, who's been struggling with this for years and you had this message for them so that they could be set free from trying to earn salvation. And they could come today and just receive it. Or today they could be set free to just know they already received it. And just give it to you and tell the devil to hush and go talk to Jesus. Because he's the one who paid for their sin. Lord, there are other ways you've, you've worked today. And I just pray that we'll be a people who respond. People who do what you've said for us to do today. For those who need to join the church today, those who need to come to know your Savior, those who need to handle a whole host of things between you and them, help us today to be able to set this time aside and respond to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We stand together.